It's a well-known fact that in today's day and age, almost anything can be politicized, which is why it's no surprise that Time Magazine recently released a list of the top 10 most Republican as well as Democratic foods. But what was so surprising is that among the Republican Party, nearly six out of that top 10 list had foods from different ethnicities as well as cultures from all across the world, including places like Cuba as well as China. But it certainly appears that while Republicans may love to eat cuisine from other cultures, they're much less receptive to the nations behind it. In fact, as an article by The Atlantic explains, dated January 10th of this year, the current relationship between the United States as well as Cuba is far from perfect. Due to four years under the Trump administration, we're seeing resentment as well as the opportunity potentially for new growth. Consequently, with the very stake of the relationship between both nations on the line, it becomes imperative that we address today's insightful question of, is it time for the United States to normalize relationships with Cuba? In which my answer can only be a resolute yes. And we'll understand why. By first, looking towards how by and large, the Cuban people are more than excited for this outcome. Second, seeing how currently there are some perfect opportunities for bilateral relations. And finally, looking towards the economic impact and the beneficiaries for both countries. But first and foremost, let's begin by seeing how at the end of the day, the Cuban people are more than excited for Biden's new administration. And this was explored upon in one Al Jazeera article, which writes dated February 10th of this year, that under four years of the Trump administration, the Cuban people are more than excited for a brand new American president. Which is why when interviewing Mercy Rodriguez, a native Cuban resident, she stated that for the past four years, Trump has effectively tried to suffocate Cuba. However, she's tremendously happy that Biden's administration is now in power, something that she sees as a new opportunity for growth. And it appears that this is no isolated response. Instead, all across the entire country, the Cuban people are more than excited and sharing the same sentiment. In fact, over 700 leading Cuban economists, as well as analysts, recently signed an open letter towards President Biden, effectively stating, and I quote, that they were incredibly excited for the opportunity to move forward and that the Cuban people at large were incredibly excited for the opportunity for the restoration and normalization of trade as well as other cultural exchanges similar to that under the Obama administration. At the end of the day, it appears that the Cuban people are excited for an opportunity to move forward. And ultimately, this will prove crucial especially given the fact that the Biden administration doesn't exactly have a very high bar to beat. Ultimately, with the normalization of these relationships, as well as a receptive understanding from the nation of Cuba, it's abundantly clear that right now is the perfect time for the normalization of relationships. But second, let's see how when it comes to terms of execution, it's perfect that there are existing opportunities for that of bilateral relationships. And this was explored upon in one Washington Post article which found dated January 10th of this year, that overwhelmingly in the case of COVID-19, it may actually be a perfect opportunity to bond both the United States as well as Cuba. After all, Cuba is infamous for its efforts in battling COVID-19 on an international basis. Known as their COVID-19 doctors, they sent them ultimately through all parts of the world, whether in deep parts of Africa or even wealthier nations like Italy, they've been recepted as well as welcomed with open arms. And this has the huge opportunity to help boost the United States involvement in battling the COVID-19 pandemic. Ultimately, that same article went on to write that the international community could reflect on how these two neighbors are coming together stronger than ever. And more than just that, it demonstrates that the United States capability of fighting COVID-19 isn't reflective of the disastrous Trump administration, but instead a new star pro a proponent of the ultimate Biden administration's efforts. More than just that, and looking at COVID-19 aside, we're seeing that existing research projects that existed in the Obama administration, but dwindled under the Trump administration, could now effectively be restarted. Take, for example, one research project in addressing cancer in the case of the Bronx in New York. Ultimately, whether it's the case of cancer or even coral reef, coral reef research, ultimately, these efforts would be something that provide the perfect opportunity for the restoration of bilateral relationships and ultimately demonstrate that as of right now, it's the perfect time for the effective execution of Biden's plan to normalize relationships with Cuba. But lastly, let's address the economic benefit, lending credence to the idea that money makes the world go round. And this was explored upon in one Forbes article, which explains dated February 5th of this year, that ultimately the economic output, as well as benefit for both of these nations would prove to be invaluable. We see on one hand for the United States, 
As of right now, Cuba imports nearly $200 million worth of agricultural goods towards the nation of Cuba, with the vast majority of it in being things like soybeans, corn, as well as poultry. But what economists and those analysts ultimately say is that this number could be significantly higher. However, it's currently being impeded by red tape as well as regulation, which means that now that the Biden administration can take efforts to normalize this relationship, it would ensure that this kind of existing red tape is removed, something that will greatly benefit America's more than damaged farmers as well as agricultural sector. And on the flip side, we see that Cuban relationships as well as their economic benefit would be absolutely present as well. And it appears that investors in Silicon Valley and the tech hub of the United States certainly seem to see things so as well. After all, before the Trump administration, we saw huge companies like Google looking forward towards expanding internet access as well as potential tech ventures inside of Cuba, something that would create millions of jobs for the Cuban residents as well as boost overall economic output and relationships between the two countries, demonstrating once and for all that as of right now, the Biden administration has the perfect opportunity to score a huge economic win while still managing to normalize relationships between both of these nations. And so, when looking back at today's insightful question of, is it time for the United States government to normalize relations with Cuba? My answer was resolute yes for three key reasons. First, we saw how at the end of the day, the Cuban residents will welcome this with open arms. Second, we move forward towards the existing perfect opportunities, including cases like COVID-19. And finally, we concluded with the overall economic benefit demonstrating that ultimately this will lead to a huge economic win for both the United States as well as Cuba. And granted, while ethnic food may not exactly be something that is universally loved, it's abundantly clear that this bipartisan effort would prove to be beneficial for both countries. Uh, I'm now stand open to cross sets. All right, so just for clarification of the judges, I'm Josh Morgenstein, I'm the seventh speaker. I'll be back in about an hour to give my speech. But um, let me start off, Alex, by just congratulating you on making it this far. It's definitely a big accomplishment and I know we're all here for each other, so good job. And with that, I just have a couple questions for you. Two minute cross-examination period, we'll start now. So the first thing I wanna ask about is on your first point. Now you mentioned that a lot of Cubans are in favor of normalizing relations. Yet the polling data seems to indicate that the majority of Cuban Americans don't support normalization. So what explains this discrepancy? And will that discrepancy pose as an opposition to normalization of relations? Absolutely. So in this case, we would obviously require both nations for mutual support. And as mentioned before, what we see on the Cuban side is an overwhelming support for the renormalization of both these relations. However, when we look towards the American side, we see that ultimately most of the Democrats, as well as an existing transition from minorities all across the nation, still seem to be dramatically in support of these cases. And ultimately, while there's no perfect time for both these nations to normalize relationships, ultimately right now still holds the most amount of benefits, something that either Cuban Americans as well as Cubans clearly seem to see. All right. Moving on to your second point, you bring up how it's sort of a perfect opportunity to normalize relations. But my question is, if we do normalize relations, how will we have any leverage to check back against the human rights abuses, such as jailing dissidents, that's committed by the Cuban government? Absolutely. So in this case, we see that ultimately, if embargoes and sanctions have only created resentment, the simple answer is we use the carrot approach. Here, as mentioned in my third point, the mutual benefits of an economics, as well as a huge overall win, would ultimately allow both Cubans as well as Americas to think twice before doing anything that would jeopardize the relationship. All right. Great. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but I do have to get to my third question. So on the point about economics, I understand that there could be a lot of economic benefits of normalizing relations. Yet President Obama tried to do the exact same thing that Biden was proposing in 2014. Why don't we see the economic benefits back then? Absolutely. So we see that there are a lot of key differences between both these administrations. We saw the Obama administration essentially hamstrung, whereas currently the Biden administration has effective control in both of the three branches and ultimately something that will prove to be enormously crucial when passing different economic policies, as well as the overall support of the Cuban people. All right, great. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you so much to the judges. The end of his first term as president, one of Trump's spearhead initiatives as president became creating a space force. And honestly, that was a long time coming. After all, there was only one group of aliens whose lives he hadn't entirely ruined yet. However, when we think about space cooperation and the fact that many ridiculed President Trump over the Space Force, 
he may have actually been right on that issue. The Harvard Business Review explains on February 12th of this year that space is rapidly growing and is currently a $366 billion industry. It's attracting more influence and initiative from other countries like China, Russia, and the European Union, all of which who are both working with and fighting with the United States on different issues. So considering that the future of global economics and potentially warfare all lie in space, it becomes increasingly critical to ask today's question. How can the United States encourage continued cooperation in space? The answer is that the United States can encourage cooperation by spearheading critical initiatives. More specifically, first, by taking measures to build a new space station. Second, by creating arms control treaties. And third, by creating global conventions on space debris. The primary step that the United States should take to continue international cooperation in space is to work with the international community on building a new space station. According to the Washington Post, on December 23rd of 2020, the space station was launched back in 1998, and that means that it's incredibly outdated. Old technology, water, and computer systems oftentimes mean that the types of research being able to be conducted on the ship are limited. That's put major burdens on NASA and other global space organizations who are looking for a better way to conduct research. In fact, NASA has said that the space station should be decommissioned by 2028, meaning that in the next seven years, the international community needs to come together to build a new one. What Wired explains on October 27th of this year is that the United States should spearhead that initiative. In the United States, we have all the biggest private sector space companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin. And by working closely with them, the United States would be able to lead a global initiative to build a new space station. Building a global space station is advantageous for the United States because studies have proven that research is more than two times efficient when nations like Russia, China, and the US are all working together, indicating that the United States should not only lead the initiative globally, but that other nations like China and Russia would follow on because they would see both economic and research advantages. However, beyond working together on research through building a new space station, the second major way that the United States can encourage continued cooperation in space is by creating arms control treaties, particularly with Russia and China. According to Tim Marshall, in his 2015 book, Prisoners of Geography, space is going to be the next domain for global warfare, and nations are rapidly investing in it. The amount of satellites in space has more than doubled in the last decade, indicating that nations are going to take a continued interest in using space satellites for missile deployments, lasers, and surveillance of their opposition. Clearly, this is something that warrants global action and global arms control, similar to what we've seen on other types of technology. The New York Times explains on January 24th of this year that one of the most important deals in the wake of the Cold War was the New START Treaty signed by the United States and Russia. This treaty limited both the United States and Russia in terms of the amount of nuclear ICBMs both nations could have. This not only served to increase stability, but also maintain the mutually assured destruction that both parties had. However, right now when it comes to space, there is no such treaty that, eliminate, that limits what nations are allowed to have or operate, meaning that there could be massive expansion of space operations in the future. Therefore, the United States should lead global initiatives, working with nations like Russia and China to build new arms control agreements such that deterrence can be maintained. But the third, and perhaps most important step that the United States should take to encourage continued global cooperation is to create new global treaties on space debris. The European Space Agency explains on April 15th of this year that there are currently more than 130 million pieces of debris orbiting the, orbiting the entire Earth. There's a multitude of reasons for this, but the total amount of debris totals to 10,000 tons and was caused by more than 560 explosions or collisions of satellites. That's a major problem for global interests, 
Because as debris becomes more prevalent, it becomes harder and harder to safely operate new satellites or the space station. For example, more than two times a year, the space station needs to conduct specific burns to reorient itself to dodge debris. That's something that interrupts research and in turn can create both economic and human damage. But this is something that the global community can work together on. The conversation explains on May 26th of 2019 that there's only one global treaty that actually deals with space debris and it was created by the United Nations back in the 70s. The problem is in that in over more than 560 explosions and collisions, the treaty has only ever punished a nation once. Basically meaning that there is no legal framework right now to punish countries who continue to put debris into space. What this means is that the United States should lead global initiatives to create such treaties to ensure that global programs can prevent debris in space, which will ultimately save lives, save money, and improve research for all nations across the world. So now, as we come back to today's question, which is, how can the United States encourage continued international cooperation in space? The answer comes down to spearheading new initiatives. First, by building a new space station. Second, by taking measures to pursue arms control. And third, by crafting new treaties on space debris. So while many people laughed at Donald Trump's Space Force, it's clear that the idea of regulating space shouldn't be out of this world. Thank you. Okie dokie, Alex, anytime you're ready. All right, sounds good. I'll start my time now. First off, congratulations on getting this far. That was a great speech. I just had a few questions. So on your first point on the creation of a new international space station, given the fact that China was banned from the existing one in 2011 and Russia announced that they were pulling out to build their own space station, why would a new one foster development as well as cooperation? Right, so there's a few ways we can address that. First, it's inevitable that if the United States pursued building a new space station, European agencies would tag along. In terms of other organizations like Russia and China, those nations recognize that the United States has the best technology and that if they decline the US's offer to cooperate, they're going to end up falling behind. So that's why they're going to join in. Okay, so kind of building on the question of that the United States has supposedly superior technology. Uh, jumping towards your third point on the entirety of space debris, Russia recently announced that they now have an, a satellite capable of effectively defending themselves, or at least are building something similar in the works. So if that's truly the case, then why exactly does Russia need the United States so-called superior technology if they're more than capable of developing their own? The technology point was about the first point. The third point is about regulations on space debris. Space debris poses a problem for all nations because it's the same parts of space that they're dealing with and the debris doesn't like selectively target some countries. That means that space debris is going to take a toll on satellites and human infrastructure from all countries. It's just a question of if countries want to work to stop it, which they've clearly indicated that they will if the United States offers. Okay, so let's speak about nations working together. On that note, especially given how secret many of these space programs are and why China was initially banned in order to help protect US national security in space, why does this, how does the secrecy somehow go away with these new endeavors? Why are nations somehow less suspicious now than they were before? I don't know if your question is necessarily about the United States being suspicious, but what I can indicate is that statistics prove that when nations are working together on global science in space, the efficiency of that research more than doubles, indicating that there's a global incentive to cooperate. All right, thank you so much. As scientists struggle to cope with the growing threat of climate change, Researchers at the University of Bath have found a bathroom-powered solution. Urine and feces. Seriously, the researchers published a 120-page report on how poop and pee can be used as renewable energy sources. Sadly enough, that is still a less crappy idea than our continued use of fossil fuels. Fortunately for us, however, it seems as though renewables may be the answer as President Biden not only increases America's commitment to climate change at home, but also abroad. Because as the New York Times reports just five days ago, a chief official in the Biden administration has said that they want to make fighting climate change the center of American foreign policy. From flooded coastal cities, to damaged agricultural output, to trillions of dollars worth in damage, 
Global warming is a global problem in need of dire global solutions. And for that reason, it is of paramount importance that we ask today's question. How can the United States restore American leadership on climate change? The answer to which is we must radically increase our financial and diplomatic commitment to fighting global warming. More specifically, by first, following and expanding climate commitment at home. Second, fueling international agreements. And third, funding green investment in the developing world. If poop truly can be used as an energy source, then maybe Trump could have been good for the environment because he took a massive dump all over American environmental policy. That is the first key area where Biden needs to start to look for a change when it comes to restoring our environmental leadership by following, committing to, and expanding our climate policy at home. As American political scientist Joseph S. Nye writes in his book, Soft Power, The Means to Success and World Politics, because the United States is a global supergiant, just implementing a policy here can inspire other nations to do it abroad. And that is exactly true with climate change. Because as the S&P Market Index tells us on September 24th of last year, while Trump cut climate regulations and investment at home, the European Union for the first time invested more into green tech than America, while China filed more patents on green tech, thus losing American leadership. And therefore, in order to regain it in this respect, we need to expand our commitment to climate policy. And it is absolutely feasible to do so. Because as a study by the Princeton University's Department on Environment and Energy on December 15th of last year concludes, it would only take $300 billion of increased overall energy spending over the next 10 years to reach net zero carbon emissions in the United States by 2050. We'd have to roll out massive investments in green infrastructure and a new cap and trade program, but it's feasible. And it's absolutely what the United States should do in order to restore its leadership. Of course, US climate policy is a lot like an acupuncturist, a major backstabber when it comes to following our international agreements. That's the second key area in which the United States can restore its leadership by creating new and following old international agreements on climate change. More specifically, Scientific American tells us in March of last year that once America left the Paris Climate Accords under President Trump, more countries looked towards China as both the arbiter of the Paris Agreement and the creator of new climate agreements. And thus, in order to restore our role of climate leadership back from China and towards the United States, we need to do the same. First, by rejoining the Paris Climate Accord and creating new agreements, outlined by the Brookings Institution on March 1st of last year, or rather this year, when they explained that the United States could implement a global cap and trade policy and other international climate commitments to reducing carbon emissions. Secondly, we need to create a cap and trade program, rather a research and development program that the Center for Strategic and International Studies outlines in 2017 as one that would increase American investment in R&D, contrary to Trump's reclines from it under his administration, thus regaining our leadership. Third, but perhaps most impactfully, however, the United States needs to fund investment in the developing world because solving climate change is a lot like eating a clock. It's time consuming. However, if we want to expedite that process, we're going to have to de help the developing world shift away from fossil fuels faster at their current rate. Because you have to remember, Western imperial countries like the United States got to develop on fossil fuels. And if we don't invest in the developing world, they will have to do the exact same thing. So in order to avoid these consequences, we're going to need massive investment. As the United Nations Council on Trade and Development explains in March of this year, it would cost 280 to $500 billion to help the developing world reach net zero emissions by 2050. That is a feasible number and one that the United States should look towards increasing investments in. Because as Forbes explains on December 15th of last year, China has increasingly partnered with the developing world. And thus, to restore our leadership, we have to do the same by investing in green tech in these developing countries. In doing so, we'd be helping them and the world fight climate change. Because as the Center on Strategic International Studies finds this time in December of 2015, 
the developing world makes up 63% of all carbon emissions, with that number only increasing. And therefore, by investing in the developing world, we'll help fight climate change and help restore our trust from these countries and our position as a leader. Of course, we'll help them along the way too, because as Reuters explains earlier this year, investing in green tech in the developing world will increase GDP 0.7% annually for the next 15 years, as well as create millions of new jobs, restoring trust in America as a foreign policy leader and as a climate change leader too. So when returning to today's question, how can the United States restore American leadership on climate change? The answer is clear, by radically increasing our financial and diplomatic commitment to it, both at home and abroad. More specifically, by first, following and expanding climate commitments at home, second, fueling international agreements, and third, by funding green tech in the developing world. So sure, poop may be a new energy when it comes to environmental policy, but we need to help the developing world and help ourselves become a new leader on climate change. Now that's not a crappy solution. Great speech. I just have a few questions. Let me know once you're ready. Go for it. Okay. Let's begin with the question on your second point. Even before the United States withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord, three fourths of the nations in the deal were not keeping up with the proper climate regulations. If these nations can't keep up with existing climate treaties, how will they be able to keep up with new ones? So two points here. One of the reasons those nations weren't following those climate commitments is because the United States didn't make a commitment to investing in developing nations, who are the main ones breaking these climate agreements. You can look towards my third point on how we can fix that point. Secondly, if the United States implements broader and more ambitious in initiatives in the Paris Climate Agreement, such as a global cap and trade agreement, these are more feasible policies that can be rolled out. From that, let's move on to your third point. Through their Belt and Road Initiative, China has invested more than a trillion dollars in 120 developing nations. These nations are in devastating debt and in light of the coronavirus are in a very bad economic situation. How will they be able to afford taking on even more debt by accepting American loans? So you have to understand, I didn't call for American loans in my third point. I called for direct American investment. One, if the private sector wants to loan out loans to these countries, they absolutely can do so. And because of the return on investment that I explained by Reuters, a 0.7% growth annually, these countries can absolutely afford to take a positive investment in the long run. And secondly, direct investment with no strings attached is what I'm advocating for from the United States. Okay, if you're talking about direct investment, you said we need to invest $500 billion. Where is that money going to come from? A number of sources. One, we could use it from the great carbon taxation policies that I advocated for in my first point. Secondly, it could come from a number of taxation sources or revenue cutting sources in the United States. No matter where it comes from, climate change is the biggest threat to humanity now. Don't worry about measly fundings of money and rather the overall impact. It's 500 not- 500 billion is measly? $500 billion in the scope of a $6 trillion global economy is absolutely feasible. That's what Princeton tells you in my first point. Great speech. Thank you everyone for judging. International leaders around the world always have the motto, speak softly and carry a big stick. But Donald J. Trump ran into a fundamental dilemma. His hands just weren't big enough to carry a big stick. And so he had to resort to speaking loudly instead. Unfortunately, that didn't play out well in the international community. And there were a lot of issues that arose with many of our alliances all across the world, stemming all the way from China to Canada to Mexico. But fortunately, as the White House explains on February 4th of this year, President Biden wants to change that and wants to renew our commitment to allies across the world because allies are more than just an obligation. Their inability to actually have people who will stand by us and have an ability to actually stand by us in the case of war or even economic treaties. So because of the magnitude of this and how important these alliances are for every aspect of our foreign affairs, it's critical that we ask today's question of what steps should President Biden take to mend relationships with traditional allies? And the answer is threefold. First is to rejoin international agreements. Second, is to increase economic investments. And third, is to revitalize military commitments. Now, the first step that President Biden can take to actually strengthen our relationships with traditional allies 
is in rejoining international agreements. Now, Iran recently warned China not to trust President Trump, but coincidentally, that's exactly what his second wife told Melania before they got married. But while Iran does have some trust issues with President Biden, it appears that those extend just beyond Iran and President Trump, because actually there's had a lot of implications on the US-Israeli relationship as well. According to the Washington Post, on February 5th of this year, rejoining the Iran nuclear deal will have two key implications. First, is it will actually make Israel happier because it will show them that Iran is no longer a threat, thus containing their nuclear development and preventing Israel from having to do the kind of attacks that they recently landed on Iran. But the second key thing that it's going to do is actually show the international community that the United States stands behind its promises, that when we make a deal, we're going to live up to that and we're going to follow through on it because we're not able to expect our traditional allies to really rely on us in the future if we're showing the entire international community that every time the presidency changes, we're going to turn our back on them. But uh, the second key way that we can rejoin international agreements to strengthen our commitment to allies and renew a lot of the issues with our international relationships is actually in joining what's referred to as the New Start. According to the New York Times on March 18th of this year, President Biden actually is already looking to rejoin New START, which is an agreement with Russia to essentially reduce the number of nuclear weapons that are in existence on the planet. And this is very important to not only Ukraine, but also Germany, because many of the countries in the vicinity of Russia want a decrease in nuclear weapons, but we're not seeing that happening under the Trump administration, which is why Biden being able to do that would reassure many of these countries about de-escalation of conflict and ensure that they are safe if their allies of the United States. But the second key way that the Biden administration can actually help to renew our commitment to traditional allies and ensure that we rebuild the relationship is in increasing economic investment. According to Reuters on February 19th of this year, NATO is in desperate need of cash because many of the countries in the EU actually reduced the amount of cash available to NATO because they were struggling with coronavirus and all of their economic struggles. And even a small commitment of just $5 billion from the United States in the context of all the money that we spend on stimulus or even just our deficit would go a long way. This is more of a symbolic gesture to show that Biden administration is interested in maintaining NATO. Because one thing most people know about the Trump administration is he very much was not. But furthermore, as the Center for Global Development explains on March 2nd of this year, actually another key area where we can renew our investments is in multilateral banks. And this isn't just giving people money, it's actually investment in banks that loan money out to developing countries, which has many important implications. Because if we're showing the world that we're willing to loan our money to international countries, then they're going to be more willing to comply with the United States requests, especially as they develop further. Take a country like India, for example, who may want to funds to develop new programs or economic investments. But when the United States is able to provide that and invest in these multilateral banks so that they can loan money, then we ensure that allies are happy with the United States and able to grow their economies alongside ours. But the third and final step that Biden can take to actually renew our relationships with allies across the world is to revitalize military commitments. Now, military commitments under President Trump were a lot like my relationship status, non-existent. And that's not for the best in either scenario. What we need to do is renew the relationships and commitments that we've had with countries because that's the only way that we can actually achieve long-lasting commitments moving forward. According to Cato on March 16th of this year, what we've actually seen is that Biden has the opportunity to renew military commitments to the Kurds. Because when Trump was working with the Kurds to help defeat ISIS, once they actually pushed ISIS further back into their own territory, Trump withdrew all support from the Kurds. And it sent a very symbolic gesture to all of our allies throughout the Middle East, including the Kurds who are very traditionally US allies. And renewing our commitment to the Kurds, both militarily and fiscally, would enable we resolve this. But furthermore, as Business Insider explains on February 1st of this year, actually further helping Mexico with military assistance is incredibly important in the time of coronavirus because the Mexican economy is struggling to be able to fend 
off the cartels and actually ensure that they have the resources in place to prevent them from gaining any more power. So the United States is at a critical junction where we can use our excess of military resources to help one of our closest allies. So at the end of the day, when we return to today's topic of what steps should President Biden take to mend relationships with traditional allies, the answer, as always, is threefold. First is to rejoin international agreements. Second is to increase in economic investments. And third, is to revitalize military commitments. This is something we've needed to do for a long time, and we finally have the opportunity to make progress on. Thank you so much. Awesome. Perfect. And congratulations on making it to the final round. I have a few questions I'd like to ask you. Absolutely. So overarching question about your entire speech. The question asks you to analyze how Biden can mend relationships with other countries. That would imply that the countries that need mending had a previously broken relationship with the US, right? Well, it would imply it had a damaged relationship, but yes, along the nature of your question, yes. Okay, sure. So in your first point, you talk about rebuilding trust with Israel. Given that Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and got along fine with Benjamin Netanyahu, wouldn't that be a relationship not at all broken, but thriving under Trump? What's being mended by- well, well, what you have to factor in is that Israel actually recently attacked Iran without any commissioning from the United States or consulting whatsoever. And they did that because of how frustrated they were about how the United States is dealing with the Iran situation, which the Washington Post evidence directly explains. Okay, so moving on to your second point about economic investments. You talked about investing in NATO for some extent. Given that NATO has had historically failed interventions from Afghanistan to Libya, why should this be the organization we're trying to mend a relationship with? I mean, the purpose of NATO isn't to intervene in other parts of the world. The purpose of NATO, as it was set up, is to contain Russian expansion into Eastern Europe, which considering what Russia recently did in moving 100,000 troops onto the border of Ukraine is especially important in the status quo. And if the United States has more of a say in it, if anything, we would actually be able to control the fate of NATO to avoid these interventionist mentalities and ensure that all of those resources are dedicated towards the goal that NATO was set up for. Okay, and finally on economic investments, you talk about loaning out to private banks. Aren't nations already so indebted due to COVID-19 that this would only further push them into a debt trap? I mean, the United States has an enormous amount of debt. And as long as you're able to maintain low enough interest rates to finance that with GDP out tracing, interest rates, then they should be absolutely fine, because obviously they won't have to pay debt, pay back debt for decades or even longer. All right, congratulations. Perfect. Thank you so much. In 2019, Swedish climate change activist Greta Thunberg made history in her carbon neutral voyage from her home in Europe all the way to the United States in a transatlantic voyage by boat. She was speaking out at climate conferences and advocacy events against the existential threat of global warming, something that all too many of us are familiar with. According to the New York Times on April 22nd of this year, climate change is one of the world's biggest threats with average temperatures worldwide rising and the environments in which we live being degraded as a result of climate change. But in order to tackle this problem, which crosses across different borders, affects pretty much every country in the world, it's going to require some serious international cooperation, even between rival countries like the United States and China. So when we think about how to address this critical issue, we face today's question. How can the United States find common ground with China to address climate change? And there are three key steps we must take. First, we need to strengthen joint agreements to limit greenhouse gas emissions. Second, we can expand trade in the renewable energy sector. And finally, we can establish joint participation in research and technology and innovation when it comes to combating climate change. But first, as I mentioned earlier, the issue of climate change and global warming is driven in very large part because of high levels of greenhouse gas emission and pollution. And superpower countries like the United States and China are some of the ones that are driving this in the strongest way. That's why we need to make sure to strengthen joint agreements intended to limit greenhouse gas emissions. According to Reuters on March 2nd of this year, right now China is arguably the world's biggest greenhouse gas emitter, and it needs to take steps to curtail how much it's emitting. But what can the United States do about it? 
Well, when the United States left the Paris Climate Accord, it sent a signal to the rest of the world and to other countries that these agreements, which are intended to limit greenhouse gas emissions, perhaps are illegitimate or are not as serious as they really need to be held to. That's why we need to step in the direction of reaffirming these agreements to ensure that all countries will abide by them. Because according to The Guardian on April 23rd, already in the past few months of the new Biden administration, we've, we've been seeing this shift back towards an international multilateral approach with agreements to combating climate change. We're already seeing that China is starting to make baby steps in this direction. For example, at a recent virtual climate summit, Xi Jinping was making some announcements that he's gonna start looking into how to cut down on coal consumption in China. Again, this is not as far as either of these countries need to be going to address this existential threat. But at the core of the issue is that by reaffirming our commitment to these agreements and reestablishing their legitimacy, we can start heading in the direction of cutting greenhouse gas emissions to a level that they need to be. But Aside from cutting down on greenhouse gas emissions, another way that we can make sure to, to tackle this issue of the climate change with China and the United States working together is by expanding trade in the renewable energy sector. According to the Wall Street Journal on April 22nd of this year, there's already quite a bit of precedent for this with the United States and China being strong economic partners. And while we have weathered some hard times, for example, the recent trade wars, the United States and China, again, are very close economically. And the United States has already been making many agreements with other countries like India so that our renewable energy companies can get the materials in their global supply chain at an affordable price, allowing for these industries to thrive. And when more of these renewable energy products are sold, that only furthers our end goal of combating climate change. According to Quartz Magazine on April 21st, China itself is also a major hub for the renewable energy sector. So there's a great opportunity here for trade that would benefit China as well. And this could be exactly the kind of incentive that China needs to help participate in many of the other things that we're trying to accomplish here, like cutting down on greenhouse gas emissions. The potential for lucrative economic benefits for both countries from the issue of trade in the renewable energy sector just goes to show that trade and economic partnerships can be a great way to get us out of this crisis and once and for all address the problem of climate change. But finally, we also have the potential for a very exciting way that the two countries of the United States and China can cooperate to address the crisis of climate change. And this is through joint agreements to participate together in research at developing innovative solutions against the crisis of climate change, according to Columbia Center for Global Energy Policy in December of 2020. Under the Biden-Harris campaign, there were numerous announcements that were made that new initiatives and new projects designed to specifically allocate resources towards researching solutions against climate change. Well, we're gonna see in the next few years that under the Biden administration, a lot of money and a lot of resources will be poured into these new research efforts. The aim of all of this research is to come up with carbon neutral technologies that will further aid our effort in combating climate change. But why restrict these technological endeavors just to our country when there's many other countries, including superpowers like China, that also have amazing resources that could further this goal? The potential for collaboration is immense because according to, a according to NPR on April 21st of this year, when we look towards the United States and China, both countries, as previously mentioned, are world's leading superpowers when it comes to developing solutions against climate change and coming up with the technology that we need to combat climate change. So if we could have these two countries joining forces with researchers working at universities in both countries and funds being pooled, we could have something that could lead to much more benefit for the rest of the world. And even if perfect collaboration doesn't work out, these new efforts to fund research and to pour our efforts into coming up with solutions could create a friendly competition and this competitive environment that will still yield the innovation and technology that we need to combat this crisis. So when we come back to today's pressing question, how can the United States find common ground with China to address climate change? We saw that there are three key steps that we can take. First, we need to reinvigorate the strength of joint agreements intended to limit greenhouse gas emissions. Second, engage in mutually beneficial trade in the renewable energy sector. And finally, pool our energy and resources together to come up with technologically advanced solutions to the climate change crisis. Despite the fact that the United States and China are rivals, and there are strong reasons for us to maintain animosity against the country of China, 
Certain threats surpass many of these rivalries and boundaries, and climate change is perhaps the most obvious one. It's one that every country has a stake in, no matter where we stand politically or economically. And as a result of that, cooperation is essential. And I believe that we can take this step forward. Thank you. Awesome. Excellent speech, Cassidy. Are you all set to get going with Crossix? Yeah. Perfect. OK, on your first point, could you clarify, is this more a verbal commitment or Biden having an executive order? Or what does this look like? Well, obviously, the verbal commitment is the first step. But like I said, I mean, the withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accord, that's something that we've been working to change. And that's a critical step. As you mentioned, though, this is definitely more of a verbal agreement. And, you know, China and the United States still aren't doing enough in this direction. Yeah. They need to go beyond words. But this is a first step that must be taken, yes. Given the deep distrust that exists between the United States and China, what's to say that they would really believe us with a verbal commitment or even an executive order, especially when we do things like leave the Paris Climate Accord every time our president changes? Yeah, so we are going to have to rebuild our relationship of trust with China, which is definitely going to be difficult because, as I mentioned, there's real reasons for us to have this relationship of animosity. But perhaps through things that I mentioned, like expanding trade in the renewable energy sector and just recognizing that we all have a stake in this crisis, these are some steps that we can take to actually rebuild that relationship of trust. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. You say that the United States should cooperate with China in terms of renewables. How should the United States specifically force private companies to cooperate with the United States, considering that's where renewable developments are happening? So as you mentioned, obviously, there's going to be some tensions with certain companies in the United States who may not want to have uh, Chinese renewable energy companies doing business here. But the way that we can have some joint mutual benefit here is that American companies will still benefit from having access to lower price supplies and materials in countries like China in their global supply chain, allowing them to sell their products at a lower price and perhaps expand their business as well. So that's the way that we can try to uh, integrate both of these economic interests together. Okay, thank you so much. Excellent thank speech. Thank you. Great. From its epic lightsaber battles to its beloved characters, Star Wars has managed to capture the hearts of both young and old as it takes viewers into a battle between light and dark within the stars. Perhaps one of the most interesting perspectives of Star Wars is how it is able to combine both completely fictional with real world lessons. Take, for example, the series perspective when it comes to foreign policy. Throughout the series, the Republic Order heavily relies on its allies in order to band together to fight the evil Sith. However, it seems as if the United States needs to catch up when it comes to some of the Star Wars movies, because we for sure have a lesson to learn. Under the uh, Trump administration, Hardline foreign policy has become highly reminiscent of American foreign policy. In fact, The Guardian corroborates in October of 2018 that in a poll of amongst 134 different countries, international approval ratings for the American foreign policy has decreased by over 18%. And ultimately, that has gone on to shape America foreign policy, even as we enter into the Biden administration. And because of this, it is imperative that we ask today's all important question. Has the American first foreign policy framework irreparably damaged America's foreign America uh, damaged America's interference in the international community? And the answer is an absolute yes because we have missed opportunities to advance our hegemony through three key ways, tech competition. Second, going on to the regional comprehensive economic plan, as well as last but not least, the focus on human rights. As the CEO of Huawei once said, it's either my way or the Huawei, and that really seems to be the direction that global tech supremacy has been taking as CNBC corroborates in March of 2021 that as of now, China has been investing over $378 billion into research and development for technology, making up over 2.4% of their national GDP. And unfortunately, the Hill corroborates that the United States is lagging behind 
because this is only around $200 billion away from what the United States is investing into research and development for tech. Unfortunately, due to protectionism caused by this America first foreign policy framework, we have lost the benefits of tech advancements by having a good relationship with China. Hi, I am so sorry. I'm in a classroom right now and the lights are motion sensitive. Sharon, um, keep going. You're great, honey. We okay. can see you. We can see you. We can see you. Yeah, okay. keep going, kiddo. Sorry, I can't even see my timer. Is it okay if I go and turn on the light? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we'll I'm stop the time. Bad. Take a deep breath. <laughs> okay, I've got you at three minutes. You good? Three minutes? Perfect. I'm at 259 right now. Okay. You keep going, kiddo. You're fine. Thank you. And then time starts now. But unfortunately, due to protectionism, which is just a result of the America First foreign policy framework, we have lost the benefits of global tech cooperation with China. One thing that the Trump administration fail to recognize is the forever dynamic between China and the United States, which is there is no winner. One country will always be walking behind the other. But what is important is to make the most out of that. And it will be a miracle if the Biden administration is able to begin to bridge that gap. Unfortunately, with an American first foreign policy framework, our relationship with other countries has turned into a little bit of a wookie steak. It's been pretty chewy, meaning that it's definitely a tough subject to bite through. And one of the biggest examples in our loss of alliances with different countries is our uninvolvement with the RCEP, otherwise known as the Regional Comprehensive Economic Plan which the Brookings Institute corroborates in December of 2020 is basically an international trade organization with countries such as China, Japan, South Korea, and New Zealand, just to name a few examples. And the goal is to break down international trade barriers and to improve cooperation when it comes to tech and security advancement. Overall, the RCEP can generate over $209 billion to the global economy. However, this is something that the United States will simply not reap the benefits out of because we're not involved. Traditionally, trade within the Asian sphere has always included the United States as a stabilizer, a third party. But the fact that we were not even invited in the first place just shows how much our interactions with our allies has deteriorated ultimately. And this is a huge blow when it comes to American hegemony. However, Trying to have a good hegemony as a country without actually trying to be involved with other countries is like a dull lightsaber. It's simply pointless. But this is a lesson that the United States didn't exactly learn because under the Trump administration, human rights just simply was not a focus. And that is just a byproduct of having an America first policy when it comes to our foreign policy. The conversation corroborates in the year of 2019 that ultimately the United States lack of involvement when it comes to human rights abuses has emboldened autocrats and also emboldened the actions of huge violators such as North Korea, Saudi Arabia and Israel, just to name a few examples. When the United States is not involved with actively trying to call out human rights abuses, what happens is threefold with number one. First, emboldening these countries and even ruining our international interests overseas. Second, it also goes against American foreign policy in which we have projected ourselves to be this beacon of democracy as well as this international savior. And last but not least, it sends a message to the international community that America is just simply not strong enough to get the job done. So ultimately, we have irreparably damaged our standing in the international community. So returning to today's original question, has the America first foreign policy irreparably damaged the United States presence in the international community? The answer is a definite yes, because we have failed to advance American hegemony through, through three key ways, tech competition, Second, the RCEP, as well as last but not least, our focus on human rights. 
Star Wars, teaches children and adults a myriad of lessons. And it's time that the United States stops to watch some movies. Only then can we achieve a new hope. Just to confirm, my time is 7.02 and I'm ready for cross. Great, thank you. And I just want to confirm that cross is two minutes, I believe. That's correct. Awesome. Hello, great speech. Is everyone ready for cross-examination to begin? Okay, I'll be starting on my first word. Okay, so let's go to your first point, which is talking about the problem of tech investment and the lack of our, and as a result of our protectionism, how we haven't been investing as much in international tech trade as perhaps we should be. How do we balance these economic interests of trade with countries like China, especially when it comes to tech, with concerns about China's human rights abuses and their abuse of our cybersecurity and our data? How can we both expand our trade with them in order to achieve these goals of having more influence abroad while simultaneously protecting the other point that you were mentioning about underscoring our commitment to human rights? That is an awesome question. As a Chinese American with ties and family in China, I understand the importance of having a good relationship between the United States and China, but there are many human rights violations within China itself. But the main mistake that the United States has taken when it comes to our trade relationship with them is that we try to overpower them. But this is not a matter of who comes out as the winner. It's a matter of cooperation. And instead, the United States should try to strike that balance by using our relationship and our influence with them when it comes to tech advancement in order to kind of create this mentorship relationship where we try to give them a few pointers here and there. OK. Also, in your third point where you talk about how there's been a lack of action on human rights, given that many countries aren't always so susceptible to the idea of the United States intervening in their own affairs when it comes to things like human rights, how can we both maintain good relations with other countries around the world while also protecting human rights? Are we going to have to stop intervening in those countries and will that come at the expense of human rights? So I think the best route that the United States needs to take when it comes to intervening in these countries is to, again, kind of similar to my last answer to your question, not to try to overpower these countries, not to say it's either my way or there's no way. Instead, there needs to be cooperation where the United States, as this kind of beacon of democracy, needs to be guiding these countries into having better human rights. We all know the famous story. In 1989, Mikhail Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, struck a bargain with the leader of the free world, a very important US icon, and the most important Ronald of the 20th century, Ronald McDonald. And just like that, the first McDonald's was opened up in the Soviet Union, bringing thousands of Russian children joy. And of course, there's the boring side of the story as well, which is that with the help of a deal negotiated between Gorbachev and coincidentally another Ronald, that being then US President Ronald Reagan, the Berlin Wall came crashing down and a new era of peace between the two world largest superpowers was born. But now, fast forward three decades, it seems as though that the hope that 1989 brought is waning. In fact, as the New York Times reports less than two weeks ago, on April 15th of 2021, now tensions between the United States and Russia are growing higher and higher as President Biden announced new targeted sanctions in response to the SolarWinds cyber attack, which was a cyber attack reported on last December, which was committed by Russian hackers against a United States technology firm. In the wake of this new hack, as well as the sanctions, many foreign policy analysts, everyday people like you, and of course, extemporaneous speakers like me, are asking today's crucial question. Are sanctions against Russia the correct response to the SolarWinds cyber attack? And the answer is a clear, and a resounding yes. First, we will understand how these sanctions will deter future cyber attacks against the United States. But second, we'll understand how this directly counters Russia's efforts in other parts of the world, including Eastern Europe. But for third and finally, we'll take a look at the alternatives to figure out why sanctions are the best response out of those available to President Biden. But first and perhaps most importantly, let's understand what the solar attack hack even was, and why sanctions will prevent acts like it from happening in the future. Business Insider provides the crucial context on April 16th of 2021, when they explain that SolarWinds is a large American information technology firm. It serves about 33,000 clients. Yet what happened last April, and we didn't even discover it until December, was that Russian hackers infiltrated it, and they sent out software updates to nearly 18,000 of SolarWinds clients. 
when users installed that update, it downloaded malware on their servers, which allowed Russians access to both compromising and confidential information. The problem is that SolarWinds serves large tech companies like Microsoft, but also top agencies within the United States government, including the Department of Treasury and the Department of Defense. As such, it was clear that Biden had to respond. But why sanctions? Well, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace answers that question on March 9th of 2021, when they explain that with Russia, the United States simply has to go back to the basics. Sanctions are a long proven, long tested method of diplomacy and countering other countries that are aggressive. But specifically, the ones that were levied on Russia are the way to go. Because rather than broad sanctions that target the entire economies of nations, like the ones that failed in Venezuela or Iran, these sanctions are targeted at specific individuals and specific sectors, such as the Russian bond market. By doing this, Biden isn't crashing the entire Russian economy or prompting a huge retaliation. All he's doing is sending a clear message to Russia that what they do cannot be tolerated. This is crucial as it buys time for the United States to develop their cybersecurity. An important observation is made by the Pentagon's own 2020 annual report, when they explain that despite having a much less budget than we do, Russia spends way more on cyber defense. We only spend about 3% of our defense budget on it. Thus, by sanctioning Russia in the meantime, we buy more time for policymakers and analysts to develop greater cyber defense and promote it in the future, giving us the crucial boost that we need to keep Americans safe. But second, it's not all about the United States. What Biden sanctions do is they prevent Russian expansion and aggression in other parts of the world, specifically Eastern Ukraine. This could be seen by a huge news story just last week. In fact, as The Guardian reports on April 21st of 2021, recently, Putin moved nearly 100,000 troops to the border of eastern Ukraine, which is a country that borders Russia. Indeed, this sparked huge fears from policymakers all across the world. Yet, what did Biden do? Well, The Economist has the answer just two days later. Biden threatened to expand upon the sanctions that were used in response to a solar winds attack. And he personally told Putin that those sanctions would intensify and target other sectors of the economy. What happened? Well, as of one day ago, Russia has already removed over half of their troops from Ukraine. This isn't even the first time it happened. Back in 2014, the Brookings Institute reported in September that Russia had annexed a key part of Ukraine known as Crimea, and they were moving further and supporting separatists in Donbass, a region in eastern Ukraine. However, when the United States and our European allies threatened and enacted sanctions against the Russian natural gas sector. What happened? Well, Russia stopped funding a lot of the separatists within Eastern Ukraine, and they temporarily had to focus on their economy rather than incurring more into Ukraine, clearly saving countless lives of the Ukrainians and indicating that sanctions are a perfect middle of the route response. But third and finally, let's recognize that sometimes in international relations, there is no good response and you just have to go to the best available. Let's look at the alternatives and understand why neither of them would work. There's two of them that critics propose, and let's look at both. The first is one that Reuters notes on April 21st of 2021, when they explain that many critics are calling on Biden to just go straight for diplomacy, full talks, full negotiations with Russia. The problem with that is it only emboldens Russia to expand further in the meantime and doesn't give us any leverage within negotiations. Rather, contrary to popular belief, sanctions go hand in hand with future diplomacy because they give the United States an upper hand in negotiations to ensure that Russia actually abides by and follows any agreement that they make. But the second, more harsher alternative that is also proposed is explained by The Atlantic on April 17th of 2021, when they explain that some war hawks are calling for direct military action against Russia, or rather through proxies in places like Syria or Ukraine. The problem with that is both an ideological one, as Biden is trying to remove troops from parts of the world like Afghanistan right now, but also a logistical one. Russia has a huge upper hand in terms of troop commitments and military in Eastern Europe. So it wouldn't make sense for a full on bloodbath before we at least try other alternatives like sanctions coupled with diplomacy. So when we return to today's crucial question, are sanctions against Russia the best response to the Sor Lawrence hack? The answer is a clear yes. Whether it protects us at home by stopping future cyber attacks or it protects people in other parts of the world who we haven't even met like Ukrainians or whether it's just because it's better than all alternatives. It seems as though we might be able to build a better future with Russia through these sanctions. So hey, maybe we can open a few more McDonald's there. Thank you. All right, thanks, Josh. All right, I'm ready for cross-examination. All righty. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> Hi, that was an awesome speech. Really loved it. 
Is it okay if I ask you a few questions? Yes, of course. Awesome. Okay, then time starts now. So in response to your first point, unfortunately, in just simple terms, US-Russian relations have not been great. Is there a risk that these sanctions could possibly drive our ties with Russia to even more tension? So that actually is not going to be the case for two critical reasons. The first is because these sanctions aren't, again, broad against the entire Russian economy. And they won't actually have a huge effect on the economy unless Russia does something else aggressive and we have to respond with more. But second, in addition to the sanctions, Biden also proposed a new summit with Putin to try to de-escalate tensions. And that goes back to the idea of sanctions working hand in hand with diplomacy. Awesome. Now, moving on to your second point, it's great that Russia is beginning to move troops out of annexed countries. Is this likely a long term decision or is this possibly a short term facade? Again, I would say in the terms of the Ukrainian um, issue, the moving of the troops seems to be long term. Again, it doesn't make a lot of logistical sense for a country to keep moving troops back and forth. It's a pretty costly matter. But again, even long term, the idea of targeted sanctions has been used for decades. So there's no reason why it couldn't be used again and again to buy the United States time in order to make the best possible decisions. Now, moving on to your last point, what edge do sanctions have over the advancement of US cyber protections and defense when it comes to cyber hacking? Again, it's all about buying time. And what sanctions do is they stop Russian attacks while policy planners can ultimately allocate more money to cyber defense. So something I'd like to just point out in the last 30 seconds here is there actually been has been a move by Congress to allocate more money to cyber defense in recent years, which represents a huge paradigm shift because normally we've just went for cyber offense and not cyber defense. But what these sanctions do is they buy the crucial time for those policy planners and for those congressmen and women to actually pass a proposal that would create more more cyber defense and lead to more of the long-term solution that you're talking about. Thank you for answering my questions. Good luck. Yeah, no problem. Thank you.